From New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston, and this is Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We're going to start again on the markets today, because the equity markets are up. This is the first day after a down week, and we're going to Abigail Doodle to let us know what is going on. Abigail? Well, David, that's certainly an important point that you just made, because last week was the first down week in three weeks. So the fact that we now have the bulls back out suggests that we may not see some sort of inflection point in this now uh, almost six-week rally uh, out of the March lows, or what are currently the March lows. We have the S&P 500 up sharply. It's a broad-based rally. All of the sectors are higher, led by the financials. Take a look at the S&P 500 financials, up about 3.2%. That has a lot to do with another piece of the risk on mood today, the fact that we have bonds lower. So investors moving out of haven bonds, that pushes yields higher. That's good for the bank. So again, that's the top sector. And then even take a look at the small cap index, really outperforming up 3.4%. Uh, a lot of investors and traders like to see that kind of broad-based move Movement. Uh, so we again have a nice risk on mood. It's still though, David, is not clear that this is not simply a bear market rally. It's too early to say that, but certainly today the bulls are out once again. Fair enough, Abigail, but that's reasonably cheerful. But now I've got to ask you about oil because it's fallen out of bed yet again today. Yes, we have oil down sharply, down about more than 25%. So the crude oil crash simply continues. And this is an important point relative to stocks because on the year, stocks are down just about 10%. Oil, however, down 80%. So both are considered to be risk asset tells. Oil, though, you could make the cases more closely tied to the economy. So the fact that you simply have oil so low, yes, of course, some of it has to do with the technical trading factors along with storage. But at the end of the day, it really uh, d it reflects this demand shock that we're seeing. And unless oil comes back, it's hard to see uh, the economy uh, looking all that strong anytime soon. So many stock investors with a bull case that folks are looking ahead to 2021. But when you have oil down that sharply, uh, it's hard to know whether or not that strategy will work. We will uh, have more information over the next couple of months to see whether or not that supply glut can be worked off. If not, it could be bad news for stocks. But again, today, the bulls are out, David for stocks. Well, we'll end on that happy note. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. In the meantime, money is starting to flow again to smaller and medium-sized businesses under that PPP program. And it's time now to start talking about what comes next. And they're starting to do just that in Washington. And for a report, we turn to Josh Wingrove, who covers the White House for Bloomberg. So, Josh, I'm a little confused, frankly, because the president last week said he wanted to give aid to states. Uh, and then Mitch McConnell said, said, why don't we let him go bankrupt? Then today I saw a tweet that said, they were sort of siding with Mitch McConnell, saying these are Democratic states, they haven't run themselves well. The president's suggesting maybe no state aid. Yeah, that's right. He said at the end of that tweet that he's open to it, but he, you know, he does this a lot. He's sort of musing and signaling that he doesn't like the idea and that he sees a political lens on it. And that will, I think, determine where these talks go. This morning, his press secretary has already been out saying we need to start moving towards phase four talks. She suggested that he wants infrastructure to be a part of it. And of course, this is all coming, as you noted, is that PPP program, the Paycheck, Paycheck Protection Program, excuse me, uh, got up and running again today. And there's already, of course, some hiccups with that. It looks like the uh, system is being overwhelmed as people sort of, you know, try to get money after it ran out uh, earlier. So we don't yet know whether there'll be more money needed for that. In other words, are, are, we, having, are we having people rush for the, uh, the, this tranche only to see it be the last one or a new one coming forward. So these are sort of open questions. We do expect to hear from the president later this afternoon during a meeting with certain executives. There is no briefing this, uh, this, uh, this evening. So the White House is sort of tweaking how it is doing its daily messaging with regards to the virus. Yeah, we may have lost those daily briefings, at least for the time being. But Josh, let's come back to the PPP program that started up again. One question is, is there enough money? How fast will it go? There is another question being raised, though, about whether it's going to the places that were intended. We already have 13 publicly traded companies, at least as of yesterday, returning something like $170 million. Uh, what are we doing to make sure this is getting to the small so-called mom, mom and pop stores rather than the bigger chains? Yeah, I mean, it's it's mixed. On the one hand, they're taking steps to restrict it. The SBA said yesterday it's going to limit the maximum dollar amount of loans that each bank can issue, for instance. But on the other hand, you have the White House sort of insisting, hey, it's working. Uh, the, the press secretary said this morning that only 0.3% uh, of uh, uh, of these loans have been, I think, about $5 million, or at least high-value loans. She's, they're trying to argue that it's the small folks who are getting that. But, of course, many small business owners are saying that's simply 
not been the case. So yeah, we right now there are warning signs, uh, if not clear signs, uh, that this will run out, that this money will run out. And after then, we don't know what they will do. For instance, there have been some Republicans in the Senate calling for more money for it. Others have been proposing different programs. Uh, so, you know, it's it's up in the air right now, but they are they do look to try to be uh, uh, restraining the program so that the larger companies can't get it. Remember, it was based on how many employees per location initially, and that allowed the sort of shake shacks of the world to tap in. Yeah, Shake Shack, of course, gave back that money that they got initially, $10 million. Finally, uh, if we're not going to hear from the president, we're going to hear from anybody on the state of the coronavirus, because we were having those daily briefings. It wasn't just the president who was there. It was Dr. Fauci, it was Dr. Burks, people like that. If, if the president isn't going to be there, are we going to have any briefings at all? It, they said that we'll have briefings later this week, but it looks like the president wants to talk more about the economy. So we will hear from him today. It'll just It looks like... Uh, it'll be potentially in a different room, and it'll be, as I said, with the meeting with the CEO experts. And that signals, of course, that he wants to start talking more about the economy. Of course, we are still seeing really sobering uh, death rates and infection rates across the United States. So he is under pressure to sort of justify why it's time to reopen. Uh, and so I think we're going to start seeing them juggle it back and forth. In other words, you might hear from the health officials every couple of days rather than every day. Okay, Josh, thank you so very much. That's Josh Wingrove, who covers the White House for Bloomberg. Coming up here, economic numbers are really bad. At the same time, people are eager to start the economy back up. We're going to get the views of Ellen Hughes Cromwick. She's the former chief economist for the Ford Motor Company. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News. To that, we go to Mark Crumpton. Mark? David, thank you. The White House reportedly is finalizing expanded guidelines for the reopening of society. According to the Washington Post, that includes the phased reopening of schools, churches, restaurants, and other businesses. The Post reports the process has led to sharp debates between health experts and other officials. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is back at work after recovering from the coronavirus. In his first public statement, Prime Minister Johnson urged people not to give up on social distancing measures. He said lifting the lockdown now would risk a second spike of infection that could do more damage. Greece will begin gradually easing its lockdown restrictions next week. The first phase will see the reopening of shops and hair salons. Churches and some schools will start operating during a second phase. Greece's prime minister will unveil more specifics tomorrow. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Well, as I said, economic numbers have been coming in pretty dismally. At the same time, there's a lot of eagerness to get the economy back up and running. So for a view on how that might actually work, we welcome now Ellen Hughes Cromwick. She's the former chief economist both at Ford Motor Company and also former chief economist at the Commerce Department. And now she is a senior resident fellow at Third Way. Welcome, Ellen. It's great to have you back with us. So before we get to some specifics, give us your general view about how complicated, how difficult, how we can go about getting the economy going again. Yes, thank you. Uh, very complicated. As you know, as economists, we're hanging on every word from health experts to really understand what the path might look like. We have these reopenings starting, and we're looking uh, for data and expertise from the health community to make sure we understand what the potential pathway is. Uh, at the same time, uh, we heard, we've been told that manufacturing may come back toward the early stage of the economy whenever it comes back because there is a possibility of social distancing. You have some experience in manufacturing. What are the problems, though, Ellen, about possible problems with the supply chain? Because the fact that you open a plant doesn't mean you have what you need, the inputs, in order to make things. David, you're absolutely right. It brings back a lot of memories about the global financial crisis and how difficult it is to to restart and get a supply chain back up and running. 
As you know, back then we had a government that did provide support to suppliers as well as to the, uh, the manufacturers. What I'm looking at right now is the risks around sole sourcing on a supply chain. When you have one company that provides a very vital component, that can cause the whole supply chain to really crumble. So I'm, so I'm a bit concerned about that as we look ahead here. What about the balance sheet? What about the cash flow of some of these companies? We heard from GM today saying we're going to suspend our dividends, suspend our stock buybacks for the time being. Ford also has had to go into the debt market and re really raise high yield debt. Does this surprise you at all? What is the financial condition of our major automakers? Well, I think this Friday when we get auto sales for the month of April will give us a little bit of insight at what run rate is now materializing. And it, as you know, on cash flow and cash burn, it all depends on where demand will settle. Because we see these companies laying plans for coming back and getting their production up and running. The big question from my standpoint and my experience is what happens on the demand side? And what we saw last Friday in the University of Michigan consumer sentiment numbers was that consumers were not feeling very good about getting back to buying, especially homes and autos. And that's a big concern. So it's a tango here between getting production back, but then looking at where are we going to settle? Are people with incomes at today's levels, you know, they're pretty concerned. And so are they going to go out and buy a big ticket item? Well, and it's not surprised they'd be concerned, really be certain uncertain, given the fact we have 26 million people so far who've filed for jobless claims. It's expected to go up a few million more this week. Uh, at the same time, the federal government's trying to pump money into the economy to try to keep people on the payroll. At what point, if ever, will we see that really take, take hold and actually reduce some of the unemployment rate? Well, I think we'll see a little bit that of that start to come in when we get to the summer months. You know, fiscal policy always impacts the economy with a lag. Even though the Treasury has been pretty aggressive in getting these checks out, I think the basic point here is that we're not done with government policy. We're going to have to see more, especially support for state and local governments. I mean, they're going to be hemorrhaging. Their tax revenues aren't coming in with the shutdown, and they're going to need help because they've been on the front lines responding to this health crisis. So stabilization funds there, and certainly more direct payments. We got a lot of people out there, especially our frontline workers, who you know one twelve hundred pay uh, check isn't really going to be enough. At the same time, we have the Fed, who has done an awful, awful lot. They're meeting this week. Do you expect more out of the Fed to try to help the economy this week? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I, I think they're really probably, this would be my guess, uh, they, they are probably scouring every aspect of what potential additional actions and facilities they could provide. Now, we've had some very good signals in terms of stabilization of different corners of the financial markets. Uh, the mortgage uh, situation is still a concern, even with forbearance and uh, helping of the mortgage servicers. But I think we should count on the Fed to be ready to launch some additional facilities if they look at the economy and say that we really need it. I mean, we can't just expect liquidity facilities to be a trickle-down approach. We have to make sure the people on the ground are getting the help that they need. And, and if you were advising the Fed, would you say that should be in the debt markets, uh, things like the Main Street facility they still, I don't think, quite have up and running yet? Or there's some talk about actually they're purchasing equities the way they've done over in Japan. Does that make sense to you? Well, certainly, and I think, you know, as you look ahead, what, what would the Fed be looking at? Uh, the second wave of potential job hurt out there 
will be in the cyclically sensitive sector. So a lot of big companies that have a lot of employees, and if demand doesn't come back, they're going to be faced with the financial strain that you mentioned earlier and having to undertake layoffs. So it's that second wave. So what kind of facilities can they help to make sure that that doesn't crumble in front of us here as we get into the summer months and into the fall? And I think, you know, some of the stuff they got, they've done on corporate bonds, oh, my goodness, they've gone much farther than anyone would have probably anticipated 30 to 60 days ago. But they may have to do more. And opening up to support large companies with large numbers of employees may be something they're going to have to look at even more aggressively. Okay, Ellen, thank you so very much for joining us today. That's Ellen hughes Cromwick. She's a senior resident fellow at Third Way. And while we've been talking here, actually, news is broken from the AP. The Associated Press is reporting that New York is going to cancel its June 23 presidential primary, and that is, of course, because of the coronavirus. We'll keep reporting on that as it develops. Coming up later in the program here, we're going to have Senator Bill Cassie of Louisiana. He has a bipartisan bill to give some aid to the states with Senator Menendez of New Jersey. He'll be here joining us, explaining why that's necessary. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. Well, oil really is falling precipitously again today. And our colleague Alex Steele sat down with Jeff Curry of Goldman Sachs to talk about what is going on in the oil market. The world's going to hit storage capacity constraints and really test those nameplate capacities. When they do that, once you hit those capacity limits, supply has to equal demand no matter what globally. That's when you're going to see the really large production cuts happen. So it won't unlikely be in those past numbers, but it's likely coming in, the, I would say, the next two to three weeks. Um, so, you know, what's happening at Cushing is going to extend and become much of a bigger global phenomenon. I'm not arguing you're going to see the same, um, you know, price volatility that you saw in, in WTI last week in Brent and these other markets because Brent's a waterborne crude. But I think the key message here is we're not out of the woods yet. Um, this inflection phase that we're in will likely last three to four weeks in, in oil, at which point when you get to June, this market may likely be in a deficit because, remember, you're shutting that supply down. Demand is improving. Peak lockdown has passed us. We think peak lockdown was a few weeks ago. So a deficit market will likely be reborn again sometime in you know, the, the early, late spring, early summer, uh, but it's still too early to buy. So before we get there, uh, how much volatility and spikes to the downside then do you expect? Oh, I think it's going to be a very violent re, um, rebalancing process. I mean, you look at it today, you know, we're right heading back down again. Because what you need to do is every time the system bumps up against, you know, whether if it's transportation, processing, or, you know, storage capacity constraints, these prices need a spike to the downside to take that supply out of the market until mm -hmm. finally you rest at the bottom and all that supply has been taken out. So expect lots of volatility, big spikes in the downside. But when they go down there, as soon as the supply is cut out, you free off the pressure and boom, they pop back up. I mean, these spike which could be, you so, know, 30, 40 percent up and down. Mm -hmm. So so let's go to the summer then. So uh, when we have a gradual reopening continue, uh, we've seen the, sh the shut-ins already happen. Uh, what's your expectation for then demand and how quickly it picks up and then the supply picture? Well, let's look at what we're learning from China right now. The one thing that was apparent is that the recovery is uneven. It favors industries like construction and uh, infrastructure, heavy industry, where practicing social distancing measures in the workplace are relatively easy. Also, those people can't work from home. Services and consumer goods have lagged. Um, however, I want to caution is that um, it is a V-shaped recovery. And the way we have modeled it is we're using China as the prototype. China worked perfect on the way down. Um, we think it's going to work very well on the way up. Um, so in terms of thinking about, you know, the demand recovery, we're embedding a similar path that we're seeing in China. Um, that expect that, you know, we'll go from 
In April, we were down somewhere around 23 to 24 million barrels per day. Um, in May, we think that number will be closer to 18 million barrels per day. So it's happening. Mm. It's going to be a gradual process. But I think the key point there is demand recovery is V-shaped. The supply recovery will likely be L-shaped. And therein lies that deficit market. Interesting. Okay, so that's what the outlook for oil is. So I'm wondering if it's the same as the metals market, because oil obviously been hit a lot harder uh, than so copper, for example, or iron ore. It, it, w why? <laughs> Um, I think it goes back to the recovery we're witnessing in China. Again, it favors uh, you know, heavy manufacturing, uh, construction, and infrastructure. So CapEx goods like iron ore and copper have been in strong demand. Um, you overlay that on top of huge restocking demand as well as pent-up demand. i give you an example. The Chinese have moved forward um, the building of the 2022 Olympic facilities um, to get it done this year. Now, that is all temporary. Um, we think there's a lot of downside risk to these CapEx commodities like iron ore and copper for several reasons. One, um, this month and early next month is going to be the weakest part for Chinese exports. Um, second, ex-China um, demand in places like Europe and the U.S. is weak. Uh, you have um, inventories building. Um, and you have yet to price it in. And then finally, in many countries that had um, social distancing measures in place were big miners, South Africa, Peru, Canada. Um, mm -hmm. We think, you know, like we're seeing elsewhere in the world, these mines will restart. So lots of downside risk. That was Goldman Sachs and Jeff Curry talking with our colleague Alex Steele about the state of the oil industry. We're going to be talking shortly with Senator Bill Cassie of Louisiana, but first we want to repeat that news coming out just as we've been on the air, and that is that New York reportedly, according to the Associated Press at least, is going to be canceling its June 23 presidential primary. It raises a lot of questions about how, what happens with the delegates. Does Joe Biden get them automatically? Our D.C. Bureau thus far is saying that they think that the absentee ballots will continue to be filed, but we'll continue to monitor that as it develops to figure out what they do in New York for the presidential primary. In the meantime, as I say, we're going to have Senator Bill Cassidy, Republican of Louisiana, with us. He has a bill together with Democrats. Democrat Robert Menendez of New Jersey, in which they want to give $500 billion to the states, despite the fact that President Trump just today raised questions about whether that really made sense. We'll ask him about that, as well as the return to business in his home state of Louisiana. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I am David Weston. Well, it's not just the U.S. economy that's struggling because of this coronavirus. The same thing is happening over in Great Britain. And uh, Bloomberg Television talked to Lord Mervyn King earlier today, the head of the Bank of England, and among other things, asked him whether there needs to be a similar sort of stimulus package for the United Kingdom. I don't think that's an immediate uh, need now. I think both the Treasury and the Bank of England have made clear that they would provide whatever stimulus they judge to be needed. But at present, stimulus is not needed because the government has actually told us to stop working, stay at home, don't go out and spend. So they are trying to stop the economy from functioning at present. To try and stimulate it at the same time would be a contradiction in terms. So the question of stimulus is for one further down the road, and the Bank of England can take whatever measures it feel appropriate uh, very, very quickly. So I don't think that is the immediate issue. The immediate issue is how to prevent firms and business from going bust. And the reason why we shouldn't prejudge at this stage what businesses will need help further down the road is that it's quite likely that no one can really know at this stage that there will be a change in the pattern of spending, people's habits and, and w how they choose to spend their money, whether or less on international travel and restaurants and more on gardening equipment and do it yourself. We don't know what will happen, but it would be a big mistake to lock in now for the permanent uh, future a pattern of spending and hence support offered to companies that would guarantee them a long-term future. What we need to do is recognize that we've suspended the operations of a market economy. We therefore should suspend bankruptcies in the short term 
in order to get to a point when we can start to allow the market economy to function again, and that will determine which businesses survive and which won't. And so on that front, in terms of supporting businesses through this, we've had the C-Bills initiative, the Corona Business Interruption Loan Scheme coming through from the government. What are the, do you see design flaws, though, either in the criteria for eligibility or the distribution in that kind of scheme? So I think the big problem with that scheme has simply been the logistics. Uh, I'm sure it's possible to design a, a better scheme and with many more weeks, I'm sure the Treasury could have done so, but uh, let's not the best be the enemy of the good. It's a pretty good scheme. I think the Chancellor might well do a good thing to extend the guarantees to 100% if that breaks the logjam of banks being cautious about extending the loans. But the real problem was that going through the banking system, which looked like the sensible way to do it, has in fact meant that we've been subject to inevitably the concern by banks either to wish to push businesses to other loan schemes, schemes on normal terms, to ask for personal guarantees, uh, concern that the banks themselves would still be bearing some of the losses. All of this has made it more difficult as a vehicle. I think the government needs to get a grip on this and to find a way through it. Things are improving clearly from the unfortunate slow start, so it is improving. Um, but I think they will still need to do more. I think the other way of approaching it would have been to have said that many businesses that were viable last year paid taxes to the inland revenue, whether it was income tax or value-added tax. We could have considered reversing those taxes, that is allowing the revenue to repay those tax payments in the form of a loan, which could, later on could have become a grant if the government decided to do that. But it, at this stage, it's a purely logistical issue, I think, rather than worrying too much about the high-level design. That was Lord Mervyn King speaking er earlier with our colleague Anna Edwards over in London. Coming back to the United States now, President Trump this morning tweeted he has some doubts about whether we should be supporting the states. That is after Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, said that the states should be allowed to go bankrupt, in fact. Well, there's a bipartisan proposal in Congress that it would actually give $500 billion in support to the states. And we welcome now one of the sponsors of that. He's Republican senator from Louisiana, Bill Cassidy. He joins Senator Bob Menendez, a Democrat of New Jersey, in sponsoring this bill. So let me start with you. First of all, thank you for being with us, Senator. Great to have you with us. But secondly, let me ask you, have you been talking with the White House? In fairness to President Trump, he didn't say no. He just said, I've got some doubts about this. I'm willing to listen. Can you fit your bill together with what President Trump wants to accomplish? I think we can. The president wants the economy to reopen. And so it's not going to reopen if, so all these small businesses that we've spent a half a trillion supporting will not reopen if a city goes bankrupt and there's not police, fire, sanitation work. They just won't. Imagine the restaurant opening its doors and there's garbage and rats in front of it because there's no sanitation. Now, you might say, why would a, why would a city go bankrupt? Well, if you've depended upon hotel bed tax, sales tax, and tourism as the mainstream of your city's tax base, and that's been totally collapsed, then guess what? You don't have the source of revenue. So I think the president will be compatible with it because it's not about the city and state government. It's about the small businesses that we've been doing our best to maintain with those basic human services. Yeah, one of the things the president tweets is, look, at some states have not been as uh – uh, prudent as other states have been. Why should they be bailed out? But we have that situation across the board with companies as well, don't we, Senator Cassidy? Is there a lot of support from your colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, for your approach? I think there will be. We've obviously been away, but I've received phone calls from colleagues I've read in the press about people who are supportive. But by the way, there is a healthy skepticism. When people in Springfield, Illinois, Look at this as a lifeline to get them out of $40 billion of unfunded accrued liability for a pension program, which has been padded for political purposes without the discipline of being able to pay for it. This is not about that. That is about mismanagement, and we should not be using federal taxpayer dollars to bail a state out of unfunded accrued liability. What we're speaking of are the sorts of revenues that are required to keep the lights on. Or more importantly, or more specifically, again, as I mentioned, the cops, firefighters, sanitation workers, without which you cannot maintain a small business. 
And so we need to draw the distinction, not allow it to be confused. We're about basic services. We're not about bailing out of unfunded accrued liability. Everybody's skeptical about that. So, Senator Cassidy, let's talk about your home state of Louisiana, which has been hit pretty hard, let's be honest, with the coronavirus. What's the situation down there, and what are your views about bringing it back to life, the economy, that is? So, um, so perfect example. Uh, the crest has passed. Uh, we've now flattened the curve. We're beginning to cautiously, re the governor's beginning to cautiously reopen the economy. Uh, I would like it to be driven by data, my own personal preference. I think it's the only way to know when to expand, when not. But if you look at the uh, – this is the peak tourism season for New Orleans. The weather here is absolutely gorgeous. Normally you would have jazz fest with every restaurant, every venue, and every hotel jam-packed with people flying in to support our brand-new beautiful airport, on and on and on and on. There would be festivals throughout South Louisiana – celebrating Cajun music or celebrating French food or celebrating uh, the, the Bro Bridge uh, uh, Crawfish Festival. I could go on. The, the Strawberry Festival. All that is shut down. Now, it is shut down, so therefore all that sales tax revenue is gone, the tourism dollar, et cetera. Now, this was a shutdown in, uh, required by a response to COVID-19, encouraged by the federal government, which has destroyed tax bases. This is not mismanagement. This is a response. And all those small business people dependent upon having their hotels full, they've lost. We've taken care of them as much as possible. But now we need to take care of the police, the fire, the sanitation in order to allow these companies, these small businesses to reopen. That's what this is about. Senator, one of the reasons that we really value speaking with you is because you are a doctor. You're a physician yourself. As you say, you know the science in a way that many of us don't. Do we have the testing capability to really start bringing us back online? We've heard from Larry Kudlow that we'll have whatever testing is necessary. How much testing is necessary? And it's not just the number of kits, but are they reliable? Because we're hearing reports now, for example, some of the antibody tests are not necessarily reliable. The antibody tests may not be reliable now, but we can know they'll be reliable very shortly. The point I've been making, though, you have to be focused. If you're in a war, you don't just diffusely put your troops all over the battlefront. You put them where the enemy is so to speak. The enemy is the COVID, uh, the coronavirus. If you, look at a, if you look at a city, there is data now that would break down where the hotspots are within the hotspots. So it's not every, every place across the city. It is in certain census tracts. And within that census tract, there are certain buildings. Now, that's where you need to be doing your testing. One, it allows you to identify early those who are infected so that you can proactively monitor Two, if they are infected, Congress has given states money to quarantine and to provide the support during quarantine to prevent its spread to others. And when you do this, not only do you limit spread, but you begin to flatten the curve even more, which meets those thresholds by which you can further open the economy. I would argue we have testing enough for that already. It's just not being focused where we need it. We need to put those testing, that those tests within the hot spots, within the hot spots that's when we get the most bang for the test. Uh, Senator, finally, as you said, you like to make your decisions based on facts, on data. There's an awful lot of facts or pseudo facts out there right now, a lot of data, and a lot of it's conflicting, frankly. And some of it, to be honest with you, is coming out of the White House itself. Where do you, what is Senator Cassidy, where do you turn to have reliable information on the coronavirus? I'm reading the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet. I'm reading uh, the kind of, there's a lot of material out there which has not yet been peer-reviewed, but you kind of get a sense of it. Uh, they are the ones who say that the antibodies that are formed from naturally occurring immunity are pointing in the direction, not definitively determined yet, but pointing in the direction of these antibodies conferring immunity. Secondly, I look at public health principles. Public health principles, if you limit disease, you need to have good contact tracing. As it turns out, since this virus is so readily spread, we have to go to modern methods of contact tracing, uh, which is what Germany and South Korea are doing, the Australians and the New Zealanders. So I also look at the examples of other democracies of how they are doing it. Right now, frankly, we've not implemented the programs they have. So when we begin to implement them, then I'll feel like we're in the right direction. So to summarize, I look both at the medical data, but I also look at success stories from other democracies 
And that's where I take my kind of what should we in the United States be doing next. Okay, Senator, really appreciate it. As I say, always value speaking to you. That's Senator Bill Cassidy, Republican of Louisiana. Coming up here next, we talk with Eurasia Group's Ian Brenner about the geopolitics of the coronavirus crisis. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, this pandemic has affected certainly the global economy. It's also affected global geopolitics. And when we have questions about geopolitics, we turn to Ian Bremer. He is president and founder of the Eurasia Group. So, Ian, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Let's start with China, because that's where, after all, this coronavirus started. What is this doing to China, both internally and externally? Well, internally, uh, the fact that Xi Jinping uh, did cover this up for the first month uh, caused enormous opposition uh, to him domestically that they needed to battle. Uh, this was by far the biggest crisis that he has faced, just like other leaders around the world. And of course, since then, their economy is now restarting, and there was a tremendous quarantine. There's a lot of pride around that. But, but there, there was still um, a lot of domestic opposition. And on top of that, internationally, um, the, the Chinese are the economy that's restarted. That's good for supply chain for them. But they're also increasingly having fingers being pointed at them, especially by the United States. And if it turns out that the United States and China are in a Cold War on the back of Xi Jinping's mishandling of this, Again, a big crisis. So, you know, I, I see a lot of media around the world that says that China's economy is in best shape coming out of this, given the nature of authoritarian state capitalism and surveillance. All true. But we should recognize that Xi Jinping is actually in more difficult position now than at any point since he started leading. And leaders I've been talking to increasingly question whether it's clear that he would get a third term in 2022. So a lot of domestic polarization in China right now. Well, that's fascinating. I mean, I thought he was essentially president for life. Do you think that that's in question? And uh, further than that, uh, Ian, if he feels cornered, does that make him more dangerous? He certainly, um, when, when he declared himself, uh, you know, this core leader and ended um, the uh, term limits in China, um, th that, that was a very big change from the way we thought about this group of faceless lead bureaucrats that always kind of ruled by consensus. It was moving from that to a more, you know, sort of Russia-style uh, authoritarian leadership. Well, there's a lot of backlash. And again, the scale of this crisis is pretty big. I don't think the story's been written yet, and we have until 2022. But, but clearly Xi Jinping knows that he has not handled this well on a bunch of fronts. I mean, you remember the initial whistleblower, the one that, um, that was, yeah. was punished and eventually caught the coronavirus and died. The Chinese government eventually apologized uh, for having mistreated him and is now considering him a hero. You never see the Chinese leadership do something like that. That happened on Xi Jinping's watch. There's been a lot of that over the last few months. And Again, I think the point is that as much as it seems from the West that China is stronger now than they have been historically, let's keep in mind that this is also a really bad recession for China. The economy is going to be harder to manage. It's going to be harder to keep everyone in full employment, harder to get supply uh, and demand back to where it was. That's a, that's a problem for Xi Jinping that he never thought he was going to have uh, coming into this year. And there are a lot of people inside the country, leaders in the country, that feel like his style of leadership has actually made China internationally and domestically more vulnerable. Ian, let's go across the border, as it were, to North Korea. What is your take on what's going on there? Because now we haven't heard really anything out of there for a while. It's strange that there'd be all these rumors about Kim Jong-un and that they hadn't done anything like to show him to us so that it would really dispel the rumors. It's, it's uh, completely unusual. Um, we've had now two weeks before he's been seen. There's all sorts of speculation that he's dead. 
There's no useful on the ground intelligence. And if he was fine, they'd be saying something. So at the very least, I think this is a this is a major health scare. Um, and we ha- saw these uh, the Chinese doctors that were sent over the weekend to provide support and obviously get some intelligence for the Chinese government. I mean, the point is that if it turns out that Kim Jong Un is no more, there is no obvious and easy succession plan. I mean, we're all talking about his sister uh, Kim Yo Jong, but um, the idea of a woman running North Korea is kind of anathema to North Korean society and governance. The idea of somebody not in Kim Jong-un's family is also inconceivable, given the mythology around how leadership um, has come you know, directly from the heavens and has been bequeathed uh, through hereditary succession. So uh, it's a little bit it's, it's a little dicey. And, um, you know, if it turned out that there was in any way uh, a fight internally over power uh, with you know, a, a 25 plus nukes and a significant military capacity in the balance, we would see Chinese intervention to ensure it didn't break down. And Ian, do we have any sense about the coronavirus in North Korea itself? We have none. Uh, they have said uh, for a long time, they said there were no cases. They then admitted that there were a few um, and that there were harsh penalties for anyone uh, that was seen to bringing in the virus. Uh, but there's no, there, there's no, I mean, we, we don't even have good data from China still on the number of cases they have, the number of deaths we have. And in North Korea, the level of opacity is China times 10. So we, we really have virtually no information other than what we're hearing from the North Koreans themselves. And in the last two weeks, that's been effectively nothing. And it strikes me as deeply ironic, perhaps, that just south of that border, South Korea now is being held up as the example of how you handle this crisis, actually. They're coming out as looking very, very competent. Yeah, I mean, it's really all the countries in that region, um, because they've spent a lot of time dealing with MERS and SARS, so they're able to fight the last battle. I mean, here in the United States, we get a lot of credit from the way the Fed uh, has responded to the crisis. Why? Well, because we created the rule book in 2008, 2009. We dust off the rule book. We use it again. Well, for a country like South Korea or Hong Kong or Taiwan, uh, Singapore, the countries that have done the best, even even Thailand, which we don't talk about as much. There's not as many journalists there, but they're doing a fantastic job. They've got the contact tracing. They did the early testing, the early quarantines. They're responding very well, and it's because they have the experience. They know what this is like. They know the damage it can do to their economy and their population, and they acted quickly. The United States, we think we're you know, invulnerable, invincible. This was a China disease. It wasn't going to come over here. We even remember we, we wanted to keep those uh, the sick folks on the boat because we didn't want to affect our numbers because we couldn't get it here in the mainland. Well, you know, we're now learning very yeah. differently. Indeed. Okay, Ian Bremer of Eurasia Group, thank you so much for being with us. I'm delighted to say Ian will be staying with us in the second hour of Bounce of Power or on Bloomberg Radio. That starts at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour. We're taking a look at GM, which is really shoring its balance sheet, getting new credit lines, also deciding to suspend both dividend and stock buyback plans. And to explain it all to us, we're now joined by Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Thanks, David. And you know, so this is a bit of a defensive move on the part of GM, and it's all tied together because they're extending uh, a credit revolver, uh, and one of the terms to extend that credit revolver, I three-year credit revolver to 2022 is that they do have to both suspend the buyback and the dividend. But this is not necessarily new because, of course, the auto industry has been in a tough spot over the last couple of years due to the trade war, due to regulations. So over the last two years, in 2018 and 2019, there actually wasn't a buyback, but the amount given to uh, the dividend significantly lower than what had been given to both uh, in the two years before that. And all of this is also consistent with other defensive moves that they've made uh, recently, David, in terms of uh, nearly 70,000 workers having to defer pay 20% of their pay for six months. They also laid off a number of people and some of their executives are also taking big pay cuts. The stock had been lower earlier, down about 3.7%, uh, but mid-morning Morgan Stanley did come out saying that this is a smart move. Uh, and so we now do have the stock trading higher. 
Yeah, and as you suggest, Abigail, this is an industry that's going through transformation anyway, in, in addition to having to convert over to electric vehicles. Are they in any better or worse shape than what their counterparts? Uh, that's an interesting question, David. I think that in terms of this cash preservation, it's probably a pretty good move, uh, and that makes them uh, well positioned. But the overall industry dynamics down 32% in March. That was just a little bit of the lockdown. April will probably be more difficult, uh, so time will tell. But interestingly, Tesla is up on the year, GM down sharply. So from a stock perspective, not so much. How about that? Tesla's up. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on GM and the auto industry. Coming up on the second hour, Bounce Parlor we're on radio. That's at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to talk to the Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin, a state that's bitterly divided over reopening the economy. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>